and uh, <laughs> yes and then it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, welcome you to topic uh, one and to the webinar on topic one with our special guest and friend of the community dave hi hello. dave hello yeah well, i don't know how i stopped counting really but it's not the first time you're with us no we've done this before which is yes. delightful um, very glad that you uh, keep on joining it's highly yeah. appreciated um yeah. for those of you who haven't read uh, about um dave uh, dave is the dean of academic academic strategy is that your title right yeah it is now yes at Still the university of the arts london mm -hmm. so um very interesting to uh, to That's see the more. online education at the University of Arts London and how you uh, uh, deal with it and um, work with your colleagues. Uh, and you are also still, I guess, the president of uh, ALT. Uh, the, yes, that's right. Yes. Um, the Association for Learning um, Technology in the UK, one of the, I think, uh, the leading uh, associations regarding learning technology in the world. Um, very inspirational stuff uh, ALT is doing. Uh, you can read more about it on their homepage and on Dave's homepage, on your Dave's Twitter profile. Um, yeah, and... Um, Without further ado, I'll hand over the floor to you, Dave, and uh, okay. take it away in your usual uh, professional manner. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks. for uh, joining us again. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so we've got uh, an hour, which is plenty of time. Uh, just to say right at the start, I really, you know, I welcome people. Um, put, putting comments or thoughts or reflections in the text chat as I'm going. I'll keep an eye on it. It's one of the advantages of this kind of space is that you can is that you know you can there can be a conversation going there. So uh, I, I really welcome people's thoughts as we we're, we're going along. Yeah, and you'll we'll keep uh, an eye on that as well. So in in the session, we're, we're I'm going to set up some ideas. And then we're all going to do the visitor and resident mapping activity. So there's a thing to do. Uh, I suggest that Philip doesn't do it because he's driving. That would be dangerous. <laughs> but it's nice to, you know, it's good that you can still be here, even though you're also uh, uh, moving around. I, can't, I like that. Um, so, but I will explain how you might have seen it. You might not have seen it, but I'll go through the process um, before we get to it. Um, but I just want to sort of set out some ideas about um, really it's largely about uh, 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 how we might understand people's motivation to engage in different ways online. So different people are going to engage in different ways for different things. And it's quite useful to map that out, especially when we're thinking about education and our students and why they, they get super engaged with something, but not with something else and on what basis. So yeah. Um, so this is a really useful quote from Kevin Kelly way back in 1997. Um, and you could argue that that's, that's the point of the web. We're now engaged in a grand scheme to augment, amplify, enhance, and extend the relationships and communications between all beings and all objects. Now, I'd argue that actually that's exactly what's happened in the intervening, however long it is, 26 years. Um, and that, you know, we're still going down that line, but essentially everything's connected to everything else, even people's washing machines and fridges to a certain extent. And that's huge. And that what that's done is, is create this massive networked environment that we all exist in to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, a lot of the time, whether we're actively participating or not, we're probably still connected. And that, and so that's created very, very quickly over the last 30 years or so, a completely, utterly different environment that education actually exists within. And I, and I guess I'd argue that in some cases, we've adapted education to account for that. In other places, we, we haven't. 
I think sometimes, and I use this phrase very gently, there's a bit of a culture war around that of, you know, actually sometimes in the UK where education does adapt to that environment, then there are more conservative voices that will say, well, that's not real education. You know, it's like an extension of the, you you know, you shouldn't use a calculator or you shouldn't look at Wikipedia, you know, and, and this year's one is, you, you know, what, what do we do about AI? You know, there's always something right that is in that tension between this sort of networked way of thinking about learning and more traditional perhaps slightly more hierarchical ways of learning so it's it's fascinating dave uh, yeah. just quickly um you you having usually usually have some slides and you have them up there i think oh, yeah. oh that's exciting yes because you know what i've done is i've done everything except for share my screen exactly so so because Yeah, that's funny. So I, I there wasn't anything uh, particularly fascinating apart from that quote so far. So you've not missed anything. Um, so I'm going to I've got a second screen, which is why I'll be looking off this way. But I, I can get that just allows me to keep an eye. If on you it. just uh, skip back to that uh, slide, then people on the recording have it as well. Um, uh, yeah, perfect. maybe you can even share your slides afterwards. But um... that's the quote. It's a good. Yes. I would. I, I mean. Yeah, a lot of what Kevin Kelly said back in the day, he was he was he was on track with. I mean, I guess it doesn't seem that big a deal that quote now, but in 1997, you'd have been going, oh, crazy, crazy techno guy, right? Um, so Kevin Kelly also did another thing called the Internet Mapping Project, and I think this is a good way of kind of setting up our brains for what we're about to do. So he just did a very simple thing because it's about perceptions of the it's about perceptions of the digital environment. Okay. So we all, the, the, one of the tough things about the network and the digital environment is obviously unlike the physical environment, we don't really have a shared understanding of it. It's quite abstract. And so when we talk about the web to a group of students or a group of colleagues, we're all kind of imagining different things. We've all got a different model of that in our mind. And this project with that very simple draw map of the internet and indicate your home, it's a good thing to do with students actually. You get very, very different answers. This is a 12 year old, largely sort of wires and computers model this is a more kind of squirrely model of like what do you think the internet is right with little blocks on it little red one down in the bottom left that's probably um their home this one i quite like i i, I interpret as a kind of information based model like there's just tons of stuff that's squeezing through a laptop i don't know and going out the other side uh and then this one where you know, their perception of the internet is just people just floating around. So, I, you know, I think that's fascinating because the people that we work with or the students that we teach, they're going to have that whole range of perceptions depending on who they are. And certainly this perception of the web is, is a relatively modern one, but it's interesting. This is from a 39 year old. Um, so, this, you know, this, uh, this version, wires and computers, And this version, just a cloud of smiley people. This is th this was done way before, uh, you know, social media got really toxic. That's why they're smiley people. I think if they drew it now, it would just, just be lots of sad people. But you know, uh, they're both correct answers, aren't they? So I think this is why it's useful to, when we're teaching, or when we're thinking about digital forms of education. Yeah, or yeah, exactly, or angry ones. It's useful to sort of. Uh, facilitate a discussion whereby people's perceptions of what they think the digital environment is and what they think the value of it is or where they think the pitfalls are that's a useful discussion to sort of facilitate because it's not a neutral environment uh, it's a highly politicized environment and everybody's got different assumptions about what the point is and what good practice looks like so a little bit of of sort of educational theory before we get to the mapping. I find this a really useful, I mean, it's from 2010, but I find it a really useful diagram, this one. It's got a sort of Bloom's taxonomy kind of vibe to it, but actually it's also got arrows going around it. And the reason I like it is because it, it, it stacks up to practices and then to identity. Identity is right at the top. I think certainly if you're in, well, if you're in any education, but especially with higher education, It's a process of, it's about identity, isn't it? I think most of us would agree that if our students leave our institution the same person they were when they arrived, then perhaps the, you know, we failed in what we're doing. 
And I've always found it useful to think in terms of identity. So whenever anything weird happens or people are upset or something appears to be controversial in my institution, you can almost always trace it back to people feeling threatened in their identity. You know, it's expressed in terms of work, but actually it's about identity. We have, you know, academics, we have specialist technicians, we have people in all kinds of roles. Uh, now, I'm going to be talking about the top bit of the triangle, practices and identity. But I just one of the reasons I like this diagram is because it allows me to sort of say access and awareness and skills are fundamental. Right. Uh, if you can't get on the Wi-Fi, you're not going to be thinking about your digital identity because you can't get on the Wi-Fi. So it, it all it does sort of rest on these things. But it's not as simple as just a ladder. It's not like you climb up this ladder and then all you're doing is identity work. You're actually running up and down this ladder all the time. Every time you encounter something new, you have to learn something new. You're sort of starting somewhere near the bottom and, 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 and moving upwards, you'd hope. Uh, so I find that quite, you, you know, that's kind of what's in the background educationally for me. I'm just going to wave at generative AI for a split second because then it's out there and we're, and we're done with it, right? Is... As I mentioned before, I think I think for me, the question with that and, you know, theoretically, we should be seeing some generative AI appearing on people's maps. Right. But for me, it's about it's, it's another technology that we that we have to figure out how to incorporate it into larger processes. So the same as any other new tech, uh, whereas I think what happens is it comes along it's this year's really shiny thing uh, and we tend to think of it in isolation rather than in how it fits into like so i'm more I, i'm less interested in what generative ai can and can't do i'm more interested in how would how might you best use it as part of an academic writing process that's a more interesting question it's the same with the image generation stuff and all the rest of it uh, so my the students at ual they'll use all kinds of technologies in all kinds of creative processes and really what we're interested in is can they re can they reflect on how they've incorporated it into a creative process rather than what did you come up with at the end right so critical self-reflection so that's where we are it's progressing quick because i made this like i don't know six or seven months ago and then i made this one yesterday because it's got no on friday because it's quite good fun the point is and how good it's getting the point is how might we use it do you see what i mean because it's maybe i'm just getting a bit old and so i get grumpy about this every time a new technology comes up along the debate is always polarized into this technology is going to kill us this technology is going to save us right always and so i think it's the role of education and educators to go mm, truth probably somewhere in between so how should we how, how should we use it? <laughs> Just wanted to swing past that. Happy to hear your thoughts in the text chat. So I'm going to tee up the kind of mapping process and then we're going to do it. So this is the bit that's worth paying attention to because I'm going to ask you to do a thing, right? Yeah, exactly. How does it impact on metacognition? That's, that's, that's a good question. I would argue you're going to need to run a pretty hefty research project if you're actually going to answer that question. Ain't nobody answering that question off the top of their head, right? Apart from, you know, various journalists and media outlets. Actually, that sort of relates to the digital natives thing, you know, which is where uh, a guy called Mark Prinsky, about, about the turn of the century, and by the, by the way, depending on how old you are, that means 2000, not 1900. I've, I've finally shifted to the turn of the century, meaning 2000 now. He proposed this idea that, that that some people are digital natives, some people are digital immigrants. And roughly speaking, you might have heard of it before. It was if you're if 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 at the point you're young, uh, there's there's digital technology around you and it's just part of the fabric of the world, then you're going to be native to that technology because it's not new. It's not something you encounter once you've sort of formed your identity. But if you're a bit older, and the technology appears when you're a little bit older, uh, then you're going to have to, you're kind of an immigrant into that technology because it wasn't part of the fabric of your world. I'm actually expressing it in a slightly more sophisticated way than he did, this sort of interpretation of it. 
Uh, what it became known as is old people don't understand technology, but young people do. Uh, so that means we don't have to teach them about how to engage with the web and stuff because they're better at it than us. And what what it did was it confused. I'm not sure. Yeah, it, it, it confused ownership with capability. I think we often do that in universities. So we see students arriving with phones that are nicer than ours. And we and we sometimes accidentally think that that means their digital practices are more sophisticated than ours or that they know how to, you know, do good desk research. It's weird the way that plays out. I think we've largely got past that now, but everybody loves a generation gap. And whilst digital natives and digital immigrants idea was useful at the time, it actually became quite divisive. And in higher education, as I say, it almost became an excuse to not talk to our students about the digital environment because there was this well they know it better than us so we're the problem we're the dinosaurs and it's just not true new new digital technology is coming along all the time we're all digital immigrants on that basis right um so i and i had and i had a uh a sort of on stage debate with prensky a, a few years ago and um i found it really annoying because he he um you know, don't want to disrespect the guy, but he, all of his comments were off the back of him making an assumption of, about what higher education was and then going from there. So it was quite a difficult discussion because he'd say something and I just literally have to go, yeah, but that isn't what higher education is. So what you're saying about it isn't true. <laughs> And he'd la he was largely coming from a kind of Russell group in the UK, Ivy League, sort of, this is what higher education is. But actually, certainly in the, in the UK, it, most of it's very different to that. Anyway, so we developed this workshop around, um, this is what I'm going to go into. We're going to do a little bit of this workshop, and it's based around the visitor resident idea. I will explain it very briefly, because um, I don't know how many people will have watched the video and all the rest of it. But instead of saying native and immigrant, and instead of that accidentally, instead of that becoming generational, and as we said, as we we're saying about metacognition, there's a load of stuff about in the future, young people are going to have bigger thumbs than everybody else because they'll be you typing on their phone all the time, or their brains are going to be utterly wired differently. And it was just all the normal generational nonsense. You know, when I was a teenager, I was accused that I, I, my attention span is going to be terrible because I watched too much MTV. Do you know what I mean? It was all the same things, but just attached to a different piece of technology. So I propose this idea of visitor and resident. And, and the key thing is, is that it's about their motivations to engage. They are not types of people. So what I'm going to do, and it's a continuum, it's a smooth scale. I'm just going to explain either end of the continuum. Uh, and then we're going to use it to draw our own visitor and resident maps. So at the visitor end of the continuum, one way of thinking about it as a metaphor is that you're you're thinking of the web as a, as like an untidy toolbox. You decide you want to do something, might be like online banking, booking a holiday, something like that. And you find you rummage around in the toolbox of the web, you find the thing you need, you use it, and then you close the lid of the toolbox and you go and do something else. You're kind of visiting, you're doing something quite instrumental, quite specific. The key thing is you're not leaving a social trace. You'll leave a data trace, but you're not leaving a trace of yourself on the surface of the Internet for other people to see. Right. And so there's some examples there. In resident mode, you're imagining you. I mean, you won't be doing this directly, but in essence, the web becomes a series of spaces or places. And your motivation to go online is to either express your identity or connect with other people in some way. These, to, you know, these are these are the predominant modes of engagement online, or at least this is a good way of thinking about it. And the important thing with resident mode is you're going to have some kind of digital identity because what you're doing is attached to you. Now, it might be an alternative. It might be a, a made up identity. It might be like a role play. It might be an alt identity, whatever it might be. But you will have an identity. So there's some examples in there. But it's not necessarily attached to a particular type of technology. You could, you could be really resident in email. We've all got, you know, colleagues. Uh, you might do this yourself where the main place they kind of hang out as a person is in email. 
then every single thing you do with them is in an e email. It might be WhatsApp for other people, you know, you're like, where, where are they? Well, they're going to be in WhatsApp. A good way of thinking about it is where do I need to go to get the quickest possible response from them? Because they're kind of hanging around in that place, right? So I think what's I think what was, is useful about it is is this per perceiving the web on the one hand as a collection of tools, and on the other hand as a collection of places that we live out part of our life in, lives in. And obviously, you know, early days of social media, the web the web very quickly became very very placey, uh, and at that point in time. Uh, you know, a whole load of people piled in because people are interested in people, right? So one of my favorite little quotes, and I don't know where it comes from, I think it's just a friend of mine said, we're, we're not addicted to our phones, we're addicted to people. You know, we're social animals and that's why the web looks like it does. Yeah, that can be a resident mode. Absolutely, Maria. If, 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 if your students know that that's where they can find you, then as a person, then in a way, your practice in that platform has made that platform into a place. It's like a social model of place in that sense. Um, but it's worth bringing that up. So in the middle of the continuum, there's all this activity that happens online, a bit like what we're doing now. It's somewhat residency. You know, I can see people text chatting. I can, I, you know, you're here, your names are attached to you. But we're in we're in within a closed group. There's an edge to it. A lot goes on like that on the internet. Back in the early days of social media, people imagined that it was all either completely open or totally closed. But there's all of this stuff that goes on in the middle, and we everybody does quite a lot of that stuff. So, for example, generally speaking, a learning platform will be somewhere in the middle because it's not just open to the web. At the extreme end of residency is things that you post that are just on completely on the surface of the web. Um, and then context is in incredibly important it, and you could put a vertical axis on this. I tend to put personal and institutional. You could put whatever you think is useful. I think in an educational context, this is quite useful. Sometimes people put personal and their course because a lot of students don't really perceive the u a university or an education institution. They just perceive the course they're doing. But the context is important in terms of motivation to engage. And then you can create a map. So I'm going to just speak to this briefly, and then I'm going to ask you all to either grab a digital device or pen and paper and sort of draw your own map. And then we're going to post them to a Padlet and have a bit of a chat about them. Uh, so this is mine from, from ages ago, uh, when I was really active in Twitter, because it was called Twitter, obviously. Uh, Skype was still a thing instead of Teams. Um, but, you know, the reason my blog's down in the bottom right hand corner is because it is open for comments. It's very much attached to me as an individual. And I only blog about, you know, work. So that's bottom right. Twitter's kind of cuts across institutional and personal because some of what I was doing in there was personal. Some of it was institutional. Um, Google Docs at the time, there was just bit of everything in there just bits of my life bits of my work it was a complete mess so that kind of went into the middle there things like email for me top left I don't chit chat in email it's just sort of admin for me so that goes that's that's very much kind of visitory because I'm not I'm just organizing things and Facebook at the time I just used it like a really poor address book to keep tabs on people but I never posted anything so it was very kind of visitory even though it's a social media platform my engagement with it was very visitory if you see what I mean so importantly the the as I was saying about email the the, the platform doesn't always mandate the mode of behavior I think sometimes we've imagined that historically and that's really tripped us up but you know we a lot of people have Twitter profiles or X profiles and they never post anything, but they still find it useful because they're learning what they need to learn from the people that they're following. A lot of students do that, for example. So they're in visitor mode in what most people would think of as a fundamentally resident platform. And I'm like super pro uh, hanging around in the margins and learning what you need to learn 
before you post anything. That's what we all do socially, don't we? You learn the ropes before you say something. That's why at the end of a lecture, when you say, has anybody got any questions to a bunch of first years, nobody wants to say anything because they haven't learned what a legitimate question is yet. They need to hang around a little bit in the margins while people are having conversations. It's the same for anything. This is, and this is how my maps changed over the years. You know, it's quite interesting having like got a decade between those two and, and you know, WhatsApp has eaten my life. Uh, uh, Microsoft Teams has overtaken Twitter in terms of where I'm resident. There's a bit of Skype in there now because my new boss likes using Skype. So that will appear there. Um, and, you know, got things like OneDrive and SharePoint. Um, I'm a little bit more resident in Facebook because I'm a member of like a sports club and they tend to use Facebook. So I'm sort of, you know, your life changes, your, your map changes. You know, it's, it's not static. So anyway, there it is. Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do now, as I said, is we're just going to spend a few minutes. If you if you grab a bit, but you can do it digitally or you can do it on paper. Colored pens are always fun if you've got any to hand. Draw the quadrant and just start doing your own map. It's messy. It's never accurate. And what I'd say about it as a process is the the conversation, the things that it helps you think about and the conversations that you might have with students or colleagues around the maps, that's more important than the map itself. So I will try, I'm not very good at it, but I will try and keep quiet for a little while. If you need any, if you want any clarification, just get on the mic, drop it into the text chat, uh, and, and, and I'll just sort of give, it only takes five or six minutes to sort of make a first punt uh, map. I hope that's okay. Perfect. So we also share maybe. Yes. Already. I was come on to that. So I've got. Yes, you. So the easiest way to do this, we've got a Padlet for you to post your maps to when you when you finished, or even when you're half finished. Uh, if you find if you get the easiest way to do it is to get to that Padlet on your mobile phone. Either, either typing in the URL or using the QR code. And then you can, um, when you get to the Padlet, you can hit the little sort of, I want to add a thing to it and take a photo of your map or upload the file. And I, I, and then we'll flip over to the Padlet and have a look at it. But I, I, I'll give you a little while. As I say, any questions about the process, then please let me know. fascinating if oh no it's back again the recording yeah yeah it, i paused it for a second and then I... <laughs> do you get a message or yeah it spoke to me oh the um If, if if everybody's found their way to the Padlet, then I'll just go back to my map. I, oh, clearly, I'm not I'm not suggesting you copy my map. That would be weird. But it might just sort of help you tune in to like the kind of things you might use. I know somebody once said, looked at their home screen on their mobile phone, and it just helped them realize everything they used, and then they mapped all those things. Ah. Yeah, back to the QR code, yeah. Mm 
I realize people will need the QR code at the point you finish the map, not so I'll I'll just leave it out there, but um put a link in the chat as well. Okay. It yeah. should lead to the same padlet. Yeah, will do, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just do this for a couple more minutes because I don't want people to try and perfect their map before they upload it. So if at the point where you sort of go, well, I'd probably do as a version one, <laughs> then chuck it into the Padlet. Um, what happens to everybody doing this is the moment that the moment that you posted it, you remember 15 different things. You see other people's maps. You go, oh, yeah, of course, there's that. And I forgot to map this. And nobody ever puts Netflix on the maps, even though that's a web based thing. Jeremy, you know I mean? it's just like. So, yeah, I, will, I, I mean, I, I feel like I'm prejudicing the situation slightly, but I'll, I'll be, you know. Be interested to see if anybody's got like mid journey or stable diffusion on there or chat gpt they've really changed over the years actually in terms of what what the predominant technologies are and also predominantly where they sit mm -hmm. uh, and i do think there is you know i'm very wary of generational thinking but i do think each generation likes to find its way into well basically nobody wants to be in the same social media platform as their uh, 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 with their parents and so that 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 generates these new platforms and these different swings you know i have um, this with my kids now yeah 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 absolutely so i think i think the crossover one is whatsapp because that seems to be the place where you do you, you know you you, you manage cross-generational things like can i have a lift or what's going on with that or where are you True. okay so i think there's a bit of activity in padlet i can see it thinking about something at the top yeah Uh, I think when you get to the Padlet, you can either just tap anywhere. You can press the, the the green button on the bottom right, and it and it'll just ask. It'll just say, "What do you want to chuck in here?" And you can throw it an image. There we go. That's easy. Excellent. I'll just wait until there's a few more and then you know if, if if and then we'll we'll have a chat about the maps but don't stop doing your map and uploading it when we start with the chat do you know what i mean i don't want to rush people it, it, it's possible to hear a bit of people discussing stuff and still be getting all your map there you go oh there's, there's a bunch coming in now oh yes you see chat i feel like a couple of them have been mildly influenced by my beautifully radius corners on my one um i'm so amazed how people can do it without a pen and paper so quickly yeah yeah that's changed over the years as well i mean obviously this is something that you can do face to face as, as much as online um and when, when when we do it face to face, we will sort of break out the A3 paper and the big colourful pens and all the rest of it. I got a theory that A4 paper 
just feels bureaucratic, just that size. But as soon as you give somebody an, an A3 piece of paper, they get really creative. They're like, yeah, crawling all over it. Interesting. Yeah, that's my theory. If you yeah. give somebody a lined bit of A4 paper, Ooh. even blank A4 paper, you're like, oh, that's just the stuff that comes out of the printer. Then people take out their rulers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, okay. This is brilliant. There's loads, there's loads of stuff in here now. So what I'm going to do, just while people are sort of carrying on finishing and post, and the useful thing about this is obviously within ONL as a course, it, you know, I think there's a, blo a blog post where you reflect on why your map is the shape it is, is a really valuable thing, but it's just an object that you can go back to. But, you know, this, what you're seeing here is is kind of the shape of, each other's sort of online engagement in a way that's really difficult to figure out just by chatting. Um, so I'm just going to pick one. Uh, I'm picking this one because it's in front of me. It's done in PowerPoint. Got to respect that. Now I'm going to guess that this person, if it's done in PowerPoint, is teaches in a relatively science, technology, engineering, and math subject. But I might be wrong. Anyway, the if. If this is your map and you're happy to have a chat about it, then I'd then then can you get on the mic and say hi, and we'll just sort of talk it through for a second. If you don't want to, that's fine. We'll just move on. So who's hi, this? That's my Hello. Map. <laughs> hi. Hello. I, I, hi. I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. And and what? Sorry, I don't know your name, and I can't see it on in Zoom. Ah, uh, um, can call me DJ. Ah, hello, DJ. Okay. Nice to meet you. So, so let's have, so do you want to just talk through your map a little bit? I see you've got te Telegram there. Yeah. Is that your sort of main way of keeping in touch with people then? Yes. So um, what I mainly use, um, I, I mean, just like what you were saying, I, I sort of thought about where I spend a lot of my time. So I spend yeah. a lot of my time um, for work on Canvas and Google Drive and Zoom. Yeah. Um, so nowadays, so for, for us, our institution has moved from Skype to Zoom calls. So that's kind of yeah. like a new thing for me. Um, yeah. Personally, like regardless of whether it is for work or personal time, I spend a lot of time on Telegram and on WhatsApp. But WhatsApp is almost now predominantly purely family and close friends. Yeah. yeah. So Just Telegram that. is where I spend a lot of my time. And uh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. YouTube's an interesting one. So presumably you're watching YouTube, but you don't post a lot of it. YouTube. Yeah, you I don't it. post at all. Yeah, yeah I watch yeah. a lot of YouTube. Um, sometimes for convenience, I'll upload videos um, just to share them to students, but I will have them remain unlisted. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. mostly I think if my social presence on it, it's probably zero. So that was quite yes. interesting to me to think yeah. about. Yes, that is interesting. Once you, if you start posting videos to YouTube, it gets quite complicated. That puts it somewhere in the middle of the map. Mm -hmm. If you've got comments open, there's a weird thing, which is to what extent is a video of you, you being resident? You know, and yeah. I, think, I think if it's a video that's open for comments, that's quite a resident thing. But, you know, that's it's quite a controversial thing in terms of online learning, isn't it? Is is you know. Or at least there's a very interesting thing going on at the moment about what's the difference between turning up to a lecture live online versus watching the recording. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, where does that sit? I think we're still trying to figure that out amongst ourselves. But no, thank you for that. That makes perfect sense. And you've got a bit of chat GPT in there. Yeah, this good. is something new I've been um, yeah. using for me personally. So. I, I wasn't very sure whether we were residents or whether we were visitors at ChatGPT, because in, in the sense that the questions that you ask, if 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 sort of the 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 things that you ask are being logged somewhere and it's eventually being fed into the model, in a yeah. way you are sort of contributing to it. So in a way you are resident to it. So I wasn't very sure about that. Well, so this is a good point. So this is how I think about it, and I think I think that m most students, most people. Uh, much, much more aware of this than they were a few years ago. So I'd say you're not leaving a social trace, but you're leaving a data trace. And clearly, that having that discussion with students is really, really important. All of these environments are kind of know who you are as a data object, but they don't necessarily know who you are as a person. <laughs> Depends how you look at it. 
So yeah. I, I think the concept of the data self is quite useful in that whenever you're interacting, you're generating this sort of data self version of yourself that's in the background. But that doesn't mean that that's the same as your social self. That's I think about it as the surface of the web and sort of the underneath of the web almost. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, certainly um, the AI, you're, you're, you're doing a job for them in terms of training the AI and all the rest of it. So yeah. Thank you yeah. for that. I'm going to move to a different map. That's great. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, I'm going to go to this one because it was the first one posted. So there you are. Uh, so, Zizai, are you around? Hi. Hello. Hello. Can you so hear this, me? Yeah, I can. Um, so you've got Canvas sort of in the middle. Is that because you're mainly sort of posting things or building things in canvas but you're not always sort of necessarily chatting with students in there it's it's more visitory is that how that works yeah yeah that's how i i guess so i mean i have been posting as a student as well yeah um yeah so that's why i put it in the middle and you've got a facebook that's similar to my old facebook where you're you're probably in there to keep connections with family or friends from way back but you haven't really post anything right that's a... yeah i haven't been posting anything because <laughs> you're all over instagram right that's your thing yes, right? yeah. yeah 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 no this makes sense and tell me about the two different emails yeah so i realized that maybe i should have boxed them together and in my newer version they are now together and um, in the middle okay yeah yeah because uh, is one of them like a personal email and one of them is a work email? Yeah, I mean, I have plenty of personal emails um, and I mostly just use them to, you know, um, subscribe to stuff and read things Yeah. Um, when they get fed into my inbox. Yeah. But with my uh, institutional email, I tend to send out more um, uh, messages to people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because I hope what you're what we're seeing here, or what you can see here, is that we're we're often using the same things, but but we might have quite different practices. You know, so the same bit of technology might exist in very different places on people's maps. So if you say to someone, we're all going to use WhatsApp, you haven't really described anything <laughs> particularly. You've just made a massive assumption about how people think about it and how they might engage. So when certainly when we're working with students, we we have to describe the the value of the practice at least as much as we name a technology, because naming a technology isn't really describing a practice. Uh, so you know expectations of how we connect on what. But I mean we've all been in this situation, you know, where you, where where we just get messages from students day and night because the expectation unless you say this is not going to be 24 7 then the expectation is 24 7 because the, the web kind of generates that and all, all of these kind of things are in here thank you for that that's brilliant i'm going to do i'm going to do one more map and then we'll, and then we'll move on please don't be disappointed either if i've chosen your map or if i haven't chosen your map um let's have a look um i'm gonna go for this one because it's because it's kind of looks like it might be on a whiteboard and I respect that. Look yeah. at that. Hi, I'm Emily. Yeah, it is on a whiteboard. Um <laughs> because I had one to hand. <laughs> um yeah, so I've put on my comment, I'm becoming decidedly less resident by choice, as in I've mm. given up Reddit, where I used to be very much resident, and I'm making the conscious effort to spend less time I don't spend any time on Twitter, um mm. for reasons you know Elon Musk mostly plenty of reasons plenty of reasons yeah yeah but I will say like LinkedIn I use for I use for work and I'm, that's the one I kind of use as the ally a little bit but it's um it makes me feel quite anxious actually like all these things I should be doing and I'm not doing so I'm taking a big step back because of my health what I my mental health I do spend a lot of time on Microsoft Teams like everybody does who uses it um the blog as well work uh, it's kind of Per is, is about work but it's like personal it's not work stuff so kind of there everything's on google docs you described my my mess of google docs um yeah. so i'm, I'm self-employed so everything is just in the one account and i know i need to split it but it's just chaotic and i don't really yeah. want to start there 
mm-hmm. WhatsApp for social life, of course. Um, Facebook, um, I don't even keep tabs on people. I literally lose, use it for marketplace and all of the like, I've got small children, so all the like kids groups are all on Facebook and that's yeah. the only reason I have it. Yeah. Um, there, that's pretty much it. I also put like you podcasts. Got, you got podcasts in there, which is an interesting one because I mentioned Netflix in passing, you know, an awful lot of, I mean, podcasts are not exactly traditional media, but an awful lot of what you might think of as leisure or traditional media is actually still the internet now. So Yeah, yeah. so I think what do I spend my time doing? Well, I read the news quite a bit because I've uh, got off social media and podcasts is kind of the alternative to mm-hmm. fill the time. Um, and kind of for work and kind of just for me. So I spend quite a lot of time listening. I think it's more visitor. It's probably more visitor than I actually put it. Um, because you go there and you listen, but then I'm kind of thinking about it throughout the day. So, well, no, that's, that, I mean, you brought up something really interesting there that's just fundamental to education, which is which is why I come back to that idea of lurking and how educational lurking is. Is you know, the, the student that comes to a lecture and doesn't say anything, it's not like they've not learned something. I mean, if we really believed that, then we'd say that reading books was pointless, right? So, so I think that idea that. That, that you, you're bringing in a different sort of concept but that idea that you can be engaged with something without without saying anything and contributing in that way I think is really important to note and I think sometimes when we think about digital education we get a little bit too focused on that kind of very active forms of engagement and anything that isn't a very active form of engagement is kind of a student that is sort of dropped out or failing and it's just not true so I think that's important. The other thing is your, the point that you made about your mental health and about pulling back from the resident end of things. I think that's in colossally important. And I think it's really useful to think about that with the students as well. So for me, one of the most important things about the maps is that it helps us to review which bits of our digital life we feel we're in control in and which bits we feel we're being pushed around by and we're actually not happy with. And you know, a lot of people will do their map and then go, I'm just, I, actually, I don't like this bit. Actually, I think, you know, I, I don't feel in control of this bit. I, 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 I feel the need to be there, but I'm not happy about it because that's the business model, right, of a lot of social media. And so the thing that I'd say to students is this is not about right or wrong ways of doing things, but it is about cross-checking whether you have whether you feel like you have a sense of agency over your digital life or whether you feel like you're being pushed around and all of us will have a different relationship with that but the most important thing is not the shape of your map but whether you still retain some kind of self-determination in 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 what it looks like so uh, you know i really respect that I also respect the post-it notes as well. You're obviously, I mean, between the whiteboard and the post-it notes, you obviously like a, you know, a, a bit of analog uh, thinking. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I'm going to move on from the maps, and I haven't left hardly enough time to do the next bit. But I, to be honest, I like talking about the maps, and I think that's most valuable. So I'm just going to skip around a little bit just for ten minutes. Before um, you move on, Dave. Yeah. And just a, a, a quick question in the oh, in yeah. the chat. Yeah. Oh, can I elaborate again on data, self, and identity? Right. Okay. Uh, so the boundary of the boxes doesn't really mean that much apart from, let's say, let's think about Twitter, to use old its old name. Uh, the reason that the boundary of my old box on Twitter was personal to resident is because some of what I was doing was personal, some of it was institutional. So uh, you might get an environment you know, a platform whereby the box is huge because actually you're doing resident, you, you're in resident mode in that space, you're in uh, visitor mode, you're doing personal things, you're doing, and some people operate like that. They just like, they, everything's bundled into one place. So, um, yes, absolutely, Sharon. Uh, I'll just, I'll go back to the data itself in a second, but I think that's a really important point you've made in chat is that, is that, Certainly during COVID, I think that was the tipping point. And we probably all found that that the, ba- that the, the, the crossover between work and personal life has got very blurry. And, you know, like my old boss used to talk to me on WhatsApp. Uh, 
because that was his preferred space. So suddenly, what was the different, uh, you know, WhatsApp pinged a notification. It could be my boss, it could be my kids, right? Some people like that. I don't particularly like it. I like a bit of a dis distinction. So we came up with this idea of, comp well, it's not a new idea, but I think we talked about compartmentalization and decompartmentalization. And because of the way that the web functions and the way that work and life and bring your whole self to work and the pandemic and all of that have, have happened, um, for a lot of us, the digital world is decompartmentalized. <laughs> And you can go to one of your places on the web and you don't know whether you're going to be seeing work stuff or personal stuff. And that can be that can be really bad, right? It's a hard thing to manage. It's a brand new thing in terms of the way that civilization works. I mean, it was not that long ago, you'd have to go to work to do work because literally the paper that you needed to look at was in a filing cabinet, didn't look, the, you know, and when you left work, you couldn't really take that much work home with you. So all that means is that for us, and in terms of a digital literacy for our students is around well-being as well, we have to be very, very disciplined about how we manage that aspect of our lives because we, we, we can we can spend the whole day at work being social and the whole evening being doing work. There are massive upsides to that. I like flexible working, but there are what we you know as as that start, as that decompartmentalization started happening i think we just discovered that we're not very good at managing our own work life balance unless it's controlled geographically uh so i think that's a really important area the data self and identity is is a quite a complex one but every time you're putting something into a platform behind the scenes that is constructing a kind of data version of who you are you know what kind of products might you like where do you like going on holiday who do you bank with and the more we interact online the more the more detailed that data self becomes and then the web can reflect things back at you that it thinks you're going to be interested in it's nowhere near as sophisticated as people claim but the, the point is there's there's a data version of you, like a mirrored version of you that's being constructed and there's a social version of you. It's just the bit that I don't like about it is that you can't see your data self. You can't get a hold of it because it's oh, too much of commercial interest and that doesn't seem right. And often it doesn't allow you to move on. So if you're in a point in your life where your identity is constantly shifting, like a lot of our students would be, then maybe their data self really lags behind. <laughs> Or whatever it might be. Right, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move back to the slides and I'm gonna absolutely whiz through just a few points, but I'm not gonna go into any kind of detail because we're we're, we're kind of running out of time. But I did that deliberately; it wasn't an accident, and we have had the discussion. So there you go. Um, so I mentioned it before. It's it's useful to think in terms of hierarchy and network, in terms of education, in terms of a lot of things. Just to chuck a bit of theory at you, I'm not going to go into it. You could argue that like a hierarchical approach to education is like constructivism and a network version of education like connectivism. I think you're going to get into this over the course, or you know, these are quite if you want to theorize this stuff, these are this is quite these are quite useful areas. Okay. For me, it's not about one being better than the other, it's about finding the sweet spot between the two. And what I've found is whenever something confusing happens at work or something contentious, it's quite often a networked philosophy of the world clashing with a hierarchical philosophy of the world, and they're, and they're like having a fight with each other. So it's quite a useful way of reading stuff there. Um, different maps that I've had over the years, really sparse ones, fair enough, probably a really good student. This person said that they didn't like social media for all the reasons that perhaps we don't like social media now, but this is from years ago, so respect. Um, some people clump right in the middle. That was a really, really young person that hadn't really got a separate personal and, and they put industrial. I don't know what they were thinking. Colours. People started annotating by putting how they felt about things on. There's a, that was the first example. We didn't ask them to do that. They just put sad face next to SharePoint, and that's quite useful. We've done that. Because you can do the mapping, but you don't really know whether people are happy or sad with them. We've literally done it physically where they've given them happy, sad, and like, cool, I'm cool with this stickers, and they put them on, and that's quite good fun. Um, oh. Some people have multiple kind of roles in life, so they've split their maps. This person had a very complicated life, and some people just love paint. Um, 
So the so what, I've gone through a lot of the so what, so I'm not going to go into this in detail, but a lot of people, this is this is from data from a big study I did where we got about 380 students to do different maps and I analysed them and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm proud to say, because I looked it up yes, uh, uh, on Friday, uh, because I, this, this session was my excuse, is that the original VNR paper in First Monday now has 1,001 citations in it or, on it. So I'm really proud of that. Uh, because that's quite a big deal. That puts it in the 0.0026 most cited papers. In, <laughs> But anyway, my point is um, some, some people have used the mapping as a research instrument. Uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, it was co-written. And my, I have to say, Alison Lekeonu is a good writer. I'm fine on ideas. She did the writing. And then you can do things with the maps, as I say, to enrich them. So you can add notes to them. You can use them as, as research data. This person's done a consumer creator thing, which sort of maps to visit a resident. This person's done arrow, arrows of travel. Like, you know, well, the, I'm currently quite visitory in Facebook, but I'm traveling more resident. Or as somebody was saying earlier, I'm actually going in the other direction. Uh, I'll, I'll put, we'll, I will find a reference to the paper. Um, and then this, I like this because it's they're saying, well, I've sort of got, you know, we were talking about when I was talking about AI and the idea of larger processes, you know, this is where somebody goes, well, and I do something a little bit like this. You know, you tweet an idea, the, the discussion builds around it. You write a blog post about it. People are interested in the blog posts. So you do a conference session on it. You know, that's the way I like to sort of develop ideas. So that sometimes there's a flow between spaces. And then this one's just got a bit of bit of everything. And then this is the last one I'll show, and then and then I'll I'll, I'll stop for a second. Is this is one of my favorite ones because that pink blog says "ideal self not real." So somebody's actually used yeah. Thanks for posting that. Somebody's actually used their map in an aspirational way and said, "Well, I want to become this digital scholar, so I want to become active in this space." Um, so I'm going to finish with this quote, which is what, probably one of my all-time favorite quotes about education from George Siemens now that knowledge and networks are abundant the whole point of the network and not scarce the emphasis should be on connections so we teachers are the arbiter of connections I just think that's a really fascinating kind of connectivist what does it mean to be a teacher in a network world where you can get the answer to anything and that's a great response to the AI thing as well so instead of taking, again, coming back to identity, instead of our identity of educators being threatened by AI, if you take this philosophy, then AI is just another thing. It's just another connection that you can make with or on behalf of your students, right? Um, and this process is never going away, no matter what technology is invented. Uh, the, the people need to make these connections and sometimes they need help making connections, right? I'm going to stop there. I can't believe I got through that last bit. Sorry, it was in a bit of a, a rush, but I was enjoying the maps. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dave. Uh, fantastic. We have a lot of to discuss in our PBL groups and um, in the weeks to come. Um, if you have questions about the course, uh, I can stick around for a couple of minutes uh, and answer those um off recording so to speak uh, also and uh, yeah dave hope to see you soon offline online or yeah, yeah. wherever and thank you for everyone for doing the mapping and posting and stuff like that it's, it always makes it i don't know it's just it makes I, I had a good time that's what i'm saying i hope you did too <laughs> excellent i'm sure everyone uh, got something out of this today thank you so much dave and see yeah. you around yeah see you bye